So by now you all have the message that each generation of artists rebels against the preceding generation. In this second to last unit, the process speeds up and revolutions and rebellions come fast and furious. In part, I'm sure, this reflects the quickening pace of technological change and the social and emotional impact of total war. Photography plays a role too. Even the most perfect illusionist painting is going to capture less of optical reality than a camera, which invites artists to define reality in terms of inward emotions, or a hidden subconscious, or an oppressive economic superstructure, or even to deny that we can grasp reality at all. So why did the post-impressionists rebel against impressionism? You read about this in your homework. Basically, they became impatient with the very element of impressionist art that the impressionists embraced, its transience, its focus on capturing a fleeting specific moment in time. Post-impressionists struggled to capture what they saw as the more essential underlying realities of our world, but they did this in rather different ways. To get a feeling of what I'm talking about, let's look at two seascapes. Bottom left is a painting by Winslow Homer, an American painter, a somewhat romantic realist. On the upper right is the painting Monet that, by Monet that gave Impressionism its name. Clearly, Monet moves closer to abstraction. But what do these paintings have in common? Well, each intends again to capture that fleeting moment. They also share a somewhat identifiable perspective. We can more or less figure out where we, the viewer, are standing or swimming in relation to the scene. Both painters use color vividly, but realistically. Remember that the Impressionists were trying to show us how our eyes actually captured and conveyed color to our brain. And here we have two depictions of a sower, one by realist painter Millet and one by post-impressionist Vincent van Gogh, who modeled his painting after Millet's. Millet is capturing the hard work but also the poetry of labor. Van Gogh seeks a deeper symbolic meaning. As he explained, these are his own words, the sower and the wheat sheaf stand for eternity and the reaper and his scythe for irrevocable death. Note that the wheat fields are suddenly blue and that the sunset comes alive with radiating lines. Color and line take on new responsibility in Van Gogh's painting and the content reflects a new reliance on symbolism. So here is the post-impressionist gang of four. From the upper left, moving clockwise, Seurat, Van Gogh, Gauguin, Cezanne. They seem a rather odd cast of characters. And by the way, I think your textbook adds to loose low track. At any rate, I would not describe these painters or their techniques as especially similar. And the art critic who first lumped them together tried to find a more descriptive term, but in the end, the only element he knew that these painters had in common was that they were heavily influenced by the Impressionists, but wanted to take their art a step further. So he labeled them post-Impressionists. Actually, I think there is another clear unifying element which is their fascination with the expressive power of color. We will encounter this term expressionism a lot in these last two units. Your textbook defines expressionism as, quote, the result of the artist's unique inner or personal vision, and that often has an emotional dimension. Expressionism then contrasts with art that's focused on visually describing the world empirically, if you will. It's art that's seen with an inner eye and it is often characterized by the manipulation of color to evoke an emotional response. So we're going to be looking a lot at color in this unit. I thought it might be a good time to review some concepts that we introduced very early in the course. Hue, value, and saturation. Hue is what we usually think of as color, red, blue, yellow, green, etc. Value is defined as the relative lightness or darkness of a color. It's an important tool for artists because they can use value to define form and to create spatial illusions. If values are close, light against light, dark against dark, the shapes seem to flatten out and they will seem closely connected in space. They won't stand out from each other. If the values are contrasting, light against dark, shapes will appear to separate in space and some will stand out from others. Your textbook defines saturation as the brightness or dullness of a hue, but a better definition, I think, is that saturation refers to the dominance of hue or the purity of the color. A very bright red is pure hue, and as the saturation is reduced, and you can see it here, the image becomes grayer, and eventually you have what your printer prompt will call grayscale. 
Other color effects, and this is very important for post-impressionist painters, are, are created by manipulating the contrast between colors. So look at the three panels on top. The same colors are used in each panel, yet depending on the choice of the dominant color, the feeling of the composition and even the appearance of each individual color is altered. The bottom panel illustrates what's called the principle of simultaneous contrast. The same colors appear to alter when they appear against different backgrounds. This phenomenon was first explained in the 19th century by color the theoretician Michel Chevrol. He discovered the changes in the hue, value, and saturation and area of a background color will alter the appearance of another color. The bands on the left and the right-hand panels are actually the same hue and value, but the different background colors affect how we perceive these lines. We will see Cezanne in particular play with these concepts in Mont Saint Victoire. Post-impressionists weren't just trying to play with the expressive power of color, however. They were also trying to solve what they saw as two additional problems with, or two problems with Impressionism. The first was that the Impressionists were making an effort to capture a brief fleeting moment, and this meant that Impressionist paintings lost some of their ability to capture the abiding reality of a three-dimensional world, what's still there even as time flows past. To try to see what was bothering the post-impressionists, let's look back at a painting from the last from uh, the last lecture, Monet's Rouen Cathedral. In capturing the momentary appearance of this building in different light, Monet sacrifices some of what Renaissance and Baroque painters had worked so hard to capture, which is the illusion of form and space. So I've snipped and blown up a square out of one of Monet's cathedral renditions. See how, when you get up close, the shapes essentially disappear into brushstrokes. The post-impressionists saw this as a loss, and it was this realization that prompted the quote from Renoir that he realized he knew, no longer knew how to paint or draw. Partly in response, post-impressionists reintroduced line as a significant design element. The other problem that some post-impressionists had with impressionist painters was that their content was, quote, insignificant, unquote. Now, I love this painting, but it's true Renoir was not trying to convey a deep message. The post-impressionists and even more artists from some of the later schools of art will examine felt that painting should address important eternal concepts. We've already seen how Van Gogh imbued his sower with a deeper symbolic significance. Well, enough long-winded intro. Let's turn now to a closer look at four post-impressionist painters, at the four post-impressionist painters. Georges Seurat and Pointillism used to show up on the AP exam all the time. He's fallen off the list, but his work heavily influenced the other three post-impressionists who are still on the list, Van Gogh, Gauguin, and Cezanne. Seurat painted with tiny dots of color that, seen from a little distance, blend and produce light-filled canvases, like the Impressionists, but with much stronger line. Don't take my word for it, though. Let's hear from a noted art historian, Bugs Bunny. He's actually going to run in and out of a bunch of our required works for this unit, so if you have time, I thought you'd enjoy this clip. Seurat's highly scientific color juxtaposition produced works that seem a little frozen, but no one could accuse our next post-impressionist, Vincent van Gogh, of painting frozen scenes. And by the way, I used to always say Van Gogh too, but apparently it's wrong. Wheatfield with Crows may have been van Gogh's last painting. Just a few weeks later, he would be dead of a probably self-inflicted gunshot wound to the abdomen. This painting appears in your textbook. Now that you know something about post-impressionist concerns, what post-impressionist elements do you see here? Well, like Seurat, Van Gogh uses complementary colors to create an impact, but his colors are bold, jarring, and disturbing. And like Seurat, he seems, seeks to restore a line, but Van Gogh's lines pulse with movement. Rather than tiny dots of color, he applies paint in thick swirls with thick raised brush strokes that in and of themselves convey line. And finally, the perspective is oddly distorted. We, the viewers, are not really seeing this scene from a single vantage point. By contrast, Van Gogh explained that he deliberately chose the colors in this painting of the bedroom in his retreat at Arles to convey serenity and peaceful retreat. But again, you'll notice the perspective is rather off. Okay, finally, a required work and probably Van Gogh's most famous work. 
Like many of his greatest paintings, it was produced as he struggled with depression and fits of delusion. Van Gogh painted Starry Night in an asylum where he had committed himself. Many of you made very interesting comments about this work in our summer discussions. So let's hear from our presenter now. Van Gogh was a friend and colleague of our next post-impressionist, Paul Gauguin. In fact, the two men spent two months together painting at Van Gogh's retreat in Arles. The visit ended badly. According to Gauguin's account, on the evening of December 23, 1888, Van Gogh confronted him with a razor, demanding to know if he intended to leave Arles. Gauguin confirmed that yes, he was leaving. He found Van Gogh's behavior disturbing and erratic. Van Gogh turned and fled, and worried about his companion's irrational behavior, Gauguin chose to spend the night in a hotel. The following morning, when Gauguin returned to the Yellow House, he discovered it spattered with blood. He was taken into custody by the police for interrogation and learned that, after, that Van Gogh had returned home after their confrontation and mutilated his left ear. Bleeding profusely, Van Gogh went to a brothel and was then taken to a hospital. Gauguin returned to Paris and Van Gogh never saw him again. And here's a famous painting of that aftermath. But back to Gauguin. Like other post-impressionists, Gauguin sought to convey a deeper meaning in his paintings. I wish I had more time for this painting. If you're interested, there's a good Khan Academy podcast on it. But note the expressive as opposed to realistic use of color. The grass in Brittany, where Gauguin painted this work, is not scarlet, nor does the painting capture as impressionists try to a fleeting moment in real time. In a letter to Van Gogh, Gauguin explicitly explained that, quote, for me, the landscape and the fight only exist in the imagination of the people praying after the sermon. More symbols, more dreams. Unlike Van Gogh, however, and more like the Impressionists, Gauguin deliberately flattened and twisted his pictorial space. Note, by the way, how the juxtaposition of strong color values helps produce this effect. Here, Gauguin is also reflecting the influence of those Japanese woodblock prints. You can see here a similarity between Jacob and the Angel and a Hakusai print of sumo wrestlers. Gauguin painted in Brittany to escape what he saw as the corruption of city life, but when Brittany didn't prove to be far enough away, uh, he set sail for the Caribbean, and when Martinique proved disappointing, he returned to Paris, visiting Van Gogh and Arles, and in 1891, Gauguin persuaded the French government to sponsor a trip to Tahiti to record the people and its customs. There, Gauguin developed a taste for underage girls, contributed to a local syphilis outbreak, and painted what he described as primitive scenes. Riddled with syphilis and nearing death, Gauguin painted this grim vision of the cycle of life and death. So let's hear from another presenter. Well, as always, there's a danger on repeating what you've already discussed, but I want to make sure you notice Gauguin's heavy use of symbolism with the various figures representing stages of human life. The baby at the far right signifies newborn life. The figure of questionable sex whose back is turned to the viewer is interpreted by some art historians to symbolize the beginning of an individual's realization of gender. The apple-picking male and the girl to his left who sits eating an apple are reenacting the fable of Adam and Eve and the quest for knowledge. The old lady at the far left sits on the verge of death, unclothed as a parallel, perhaps, to the baby on the painting on the right. Many historians view Cezanne as the true founder of what we tend to call modern art. Like Seurat, he studied the science of color, and like all of the post-Impressionists, he worried that the Impressionist painting lacked form, structure, and serious content. But Cezanne also moved toward greater abstraction, and he took even more liberties with space and time. So let's hear from the next presenter. Oops. Sorry, just one comment about this work, which may repeat what you've already heard. The painting is an extended experiment in color juxtaposition. The small patches of juxtaposed colors with the cool colors receding and the warm colors advancing give a sense of spatial depth, and that was quite deliberate. But what really makes Cezanne the founder of modern abstract art is the way he plays with perspective. Since the Renaissance, artists had struggled to create the illusion of space on a two-dimensional canvas. We've talked about that a lot. Cezanne rejected one-point perspective. 
Instead, he tried to capture the same scene from different viewing positions and even different points in time. Basically, Cezanne wanted to have it all. He wanted to create an illusionistic three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional canvas, but he also wanted to expose the two-dimensional reality of all paintings, more painterly focus. Some of his techniques are easier to see in this rather similar painting. Note how Cezanne adapts the Impressionist short, thick brush strokes, grouping related colors into a kind of block of color. He also reintroduces the traditional black shadows and outlines, focus on line. By the way, Cezanne's brush strokes evolved. Initially, he used thick impasto style brush strokes like Monet's. Later, he moved toward a much lighter application of paint. And that's what he uses in Mount Saint Victoire. So understand that loose, loose brush strokes are not always the same as thick, heavy brush strokes or impasto. Again, this snip gives you a sense of how Cezanne used blocks of color and a stronger line. Basically, he's trying to get us to look at pictures both two dimensionally, up close, and three dimensionally when we get back and regain a sense of depth and space. So let's look at this painting one last time. Note that Cezanne uses atmospheric perspective to help create depth, yet the patches of color do not get smaller as they move further back. So again, the landscape both provides an illusion of 3D space and a two-dimensional use of color. On to a couple of very strange end-of-century paintings.